1998 was the day that QNET was born. But just like anything that is born, there is a gestation period before that where things are formed, shaped, and prepared. In this video, I'd like to talk about that period of time before QNET was born. Unlike a baby that takes nine months though, this particular baby took six months. Six very short, very fast, and very furious months that led to that evening. So tonight, I'm here to actually go through that six-month period with no less than two of the people who I was with during that time, Japa. Day one for you was March 15, yes. 1998. Yes, uh, sorry, I remember. <laughs> it's been quite some time. What was the that day like for you? What 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 was disrupted in your life? What was the challenge you were going through at that time personally? And how did March 15, 1998 disrupt your life? Well, March 15 was the day we had to meet the founders of previous company and so that time that meeting was very crucial for us because we had to sort of like do our due diligence we wanted to know the personalities behind this company were they real people you know but we're really looking at that time we want to catch the wave we were always discussing hey we got to catch a company from its birth in this country and so that was the mission so we were already on a lookout for the next big MLM coming into the Philippines. So at three o'clock, VJ turned to me, said, okay, we gotta invite people. We gotta fill up, you know, the, the Mandarin room, the function room. There was a total of, I think, 50 chair in the function room. So we had three hours to make our phone calls. <laughs> and during that time, it was still the, you know, regular rotary phone. So we were calling, I called my mom, I called anybody I could call, friends, just to fill up the room. Now, I knew that the people I invited that time would not really join the business, but we needed just to start. I know from there we're going to start and just keep the you know, ball rolling. So you approached the meeting with the two gentlemen from the U.S., right, with a lot of hesitation, but you went home that night different. You were excited, right? It was the same thing for me, Japa. My day one was March 15, 1998. Yeah. So I was one of those people <laughs> that got called and I sat on the second row. And there were these two gentlemen started drawing circles on the board. And I couldn't understand what they were saying. But the disruption for me was earning dollars and do so weekly. I didn't know it was the same for you. But, right. Yeah. Because at yeah. that time, I was really, my belief in network marketing was really at its lowest. In fact, I thought I would never do this anymore. I had come from a previous experience that was very traumatic. Yeah. Right. And so I thought I was done with network marketing. PG, what was day one for you? Well, day one officially was sometime about, I think, first or second week of May. Officially. Okay. And officially, it was one month earlier. The reason I say that is because it took me about one month to think about yes, I this know. opportunity. I remember. <laughs> uh, I we would, all do. I would, I would come in at 10, right. but only to criticize yeah, and question. Yeah. Okay, and question everybody. And, and prove that it was not going to work. Exactly. Now, I remember TG, you were, it was a presentation in your mom's house. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you were not listening at all no, to the I presentation. Was, you texting. were just on your yeah. phone. I was convinced it was not going to work. Right. It actually took me a month before I actually believed in it enough for me to do the business. But only after my mother told me, sounds good. Why don't you try it? That was the only time that I said, okay, I'll try it. Okay, but, 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 <laughs> only after she told me she was that gonna she was going to pay for it. <laughs> So we fast forward. Uh, you were talking about the first night, March 15, 30 people, okay, of which I was there. I was one of the 30. And then, TG, you come in May, 
right? And before you know it, we were packing the ballroom of one of the five-star hotels here in the city three times a week. Yes, right? maybe 2,000 packs. Exactly. We were packing that. Checks were being shown, yes. right? You were making money, you know, people were really on a high to the point, Japa, where you were invited to go to the U.S. Because? Well, I wasn't exactly invited. It was one of their, I think, promo or carrot, the first top earner, okay, which was me at that time, would I get a free trip to see the headquarters right. in Texas, right. Houston. It was my trip was pretty much two prong. One, take advantage of the trip, check Houston, what they were saying, whether it's true, how many staff they have there, how big the office, sort of like gauge whether or not they could actually support the network we're building. Because at that time, I remember VJ wanted India, wanted China, wanted he he wanted to pack the you know the the countries were going to be opening up. So it was big. We were not just looking at Philippines at that time. We were looking at a global scale, at least Asia, at least the air, the, the countries that normally, you know, people in the West would not be entering. Yeah. So we were thinking big time. So we had to like, sort of like scale them out, make sure that they have the right support because we were having problems. We were having some delays and stuff. And, and so and at the same time, also to convince them, guys, don't walk out on us because we're really dead serious on taking you, you know, to the, next level. to the next level. This was sometime June, I remember. And we were faced with the unthinkable challenge, which was after your trip, right? Realizing that these people, these two gentlemen, had no intention to make good on what they committed. Totally. Okay? Tell us more about that. You know, Donna, it's, the memories is just so strong for me right now. And I remember the feeling I had that day was just like my world crumbled under. Because I was so excited. Everything, I could see the future, what's happening, what we're building. And the people back home that we brought in, convinced. And the, just the sight of just seeing that it's going to collapse on us because they're not fulfilling their promise. It was so difficult for me to wake up that day when I came back home. And I couldn't wake up. I, I don't know how I was going to be. In fact, I remember I have to be in this, standing in this room and I had to be the breaker of the bad news. Yeah, I remember that. But I remember that morning, BJ calling me. And he, in fact, he went to my house with a smile. And I was like, what's wrong with this guy? We're just like, my our world just crumbled. And Vijay had this smile. And I was saying, Vijay, you know, we're like, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to go up on that stage. I cannot. I just cannot tell those people it's gone. My networking career, dead. He said, Japa, can you not see the opportunity here in every challenges? And this is where I respect Vijay so much because he's so far-sighted in terms of as a visionary. And I'm not saying this because it's my partner. He saw something I didn't see. He saw an opportunity to turn it around. He said, Japa, in any chaos, in any challenges, we could turn it around. Get up. You know what I mean? Fight. The battle is not over. Are you dead? Are you going to retire now? You're still young. We got to fight this. I, I trusted in him and I, okay, let's do this. I know. Now, Japa, you came back from the States. Basically, you said, Done. We're not, we can't work with these guys. No. However, we still had one go. VJ wanted to do one more go. I remember we were in his dining table. Right. Okay. And VJ gives them a call. Right? Yeah. Because he wanted to hear it from them. Yeah. It, it was more of just confirmation. Right. Because we always taught our leaders that we don't just jump ship. Right. So he, he just really wanted to confirm. Right. And those guys couldn't fit. We're done. I know, but see, to us, remember TG, uh, the telling moment, which I really remember uh, that night on that call, was VJ trying so hard to show them how we could make this work still. But when these guys asked him, VJ, why are you so interested 
in making this work for those Filipinos. Right. When a two hundred dollar check, four hundred dollars, something like that. It's a lot of. But I, 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 I remember. I also asked VJ, why do you need this phone call for VJ? He said, no, this is more for the people with us. Yeah. They have to see that I've exhausted, right. that I really tried. They so, have to see this, that I'm not just jumping shit. So to me, Japa, I felt the same way where all of a sudden, shocks. You know, we're riding this wave and then all of a sudden, the idea that everything was going to collapse. But seeing VJ try, but at the same, you know what really disrupted me that night was knowing that that comment about the Filipinos was taken as offensively by VJ as we did. Yeah. And I said, okay, whatever's gonna happen, okay, <laughs> he's gonna take care of us and he's gonna take care of this. How did you feel that night, VJ? I was angry. I was very angry. Uh, we were working very, very hard to earn our money and for him to unilaterally change the compensation plan because he felt that we were making too much money was just not right. I could not imagine any one of us today, for example, in QNET, actually trying to do something like that, to Remotely. cheat the network, exactly, of, of hard-earned money. But to them, it seemed like it was perfectly fine. They were making too much, so I changed it. And I was very, very upset. And uh, in, in my mind, I told myself there was no way I was going to work with these people. Yeah, so that was done. Okay, that night, that call for everyone, yeah. right? Shut the door. VJ yeah. says, we're going to have to make this work. Right. Details were discussed and so forth. Okay, TG, yeah. you had to overnight create Set up, uh, IT. IT. <laughs> Actually, I, I could not forget that day, okay, that, that meeting around the table because uh, when VJ at that time asked, okay, so who's going to computerize the system? I look at everyone. And I said to myself, oh my God, I don't think anybody here uses a computer. <laughs> okay. And having had some background in uh, computer programming, I said, that's when I committed. Yeah. I said, uh, reluctantly, I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, well, it was with the help actually of my sister, okay, who was also quite good at programming, that we were able to create that system that allowed us to continue the business somehow. So from June... To September. September, running two companies practically, setting up one while maintaining this, leading up to September 8, 1998, which was the night of the big reveal right here, right here at the Philippine Stock Exchange Auditorium. Capacity of 400 people. We were not sure who was going to come. We were not sure if people were going to believe us. Right? Because, E.G., what did it have to entail for Gold Quest to start? Well, uh, if we were talking about that particular that night, okay, uh, one thing that I could not forget was walking into this auditorium and seeing a lot of armed personnel outside with high-powered automatic weapons. I, I said to myself, why? Why do we have this? Okay, And uh, later on, I understood that it was uh, for our own protection, just in case uh, the other company would try to stop us from, from continuing the business. But uh, it was a, it, I was very unsure of what was going to happen that evening. But uh, I just thank God that uh, after that evening was over, I felt re so relieved that somehow we worked things out in such a way that they accepted our explanation. And I guess the, the rest is history. Uh, the company grew much, much bigger after that. The night Gold Quest was born, Japa, what was that night like for you? You didn't want to get up that morning. DJ needed to go to your house and say, can't you see the opportunity? You didn't see it that morning, yet you showed up the bearer of the bad news. But that night was already a preparation. That night was a three-month preparation yeah. before we actually... We told them the bad news, what was going on, so at least they would understand why we're creating another uh, company. Mm -hmm. Basically, to grandfather, to adopt the network, because mm -hmm. the situation at that time, there <coughs> were, I believe, a total of 500,000 worth of products 
that was not delivered. Commission checks almost I think amounting almost to two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the commission that was not paid that, and we had to promise that we're gonna pay this as you know in terms of compensation to them. But they had to give us one year. They were there. They joined because of our you know uh, us convincing them that this is a good company. So to sort of like. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we had to back up the promises we made. We had to continue. And, of course, there was, like, a lot of uncertainty. In fact, after that night, starting the next day, we were still dealing with... Every night. Every night. We had there were thousands of questions. Meetings Who's every night. Investors? Who, where are you going to get the money? How yeah. would this... And a lot of this, and it was... Oh, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking back... This guy, wow, how did we made it through those, you know, times? Because every night was just so stressful. You know when how people, when they get so insecure about the future and stuff like that, and they're just like relying on us and to hold hands with them. And so we had to hold hands with pretty much most of the network, the leaders that we had. And those leaders somehow believed in us. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, Ferdi Tolentino. Yeah. He believed and we held hands and face all the challenges and somehow we're here today it's been 20 years and right. this room did not change it's still the same room exactly the same exactly the same. it looked much bigger it looked back then bigger that time because i think this is the first big uh, venue but i mean it's amazing i mean it's uh it's really great to reminisce to reminisce and be in this you know room again and to somehow share with our you know audience at the VCON, this, you know, events that took place, because I believe yeah. this is a very special event in our lives, because you could see that we're not always successful. We started from the rock bottom, all of us, individually as a company, we really started at the bottom, and I'm sure a lot of them are experiencing a similar thing. So we're not speaking from up here, down, pull, trying to pull them up. In fact, we're letting them see that, hey, we started here too. You could start from wherever you are now, even your rock bottom, you could actually bring it up. And one thing, if I, something I could share, Donna, one thing I learned mm. all these 20 years is that, God, just don't quit. Yeah. Right? And just fight whatever battle that is in front of you. And that's the, that's the secret to, you know, succeeding. Yeah. What do you think is going to be the biggest challenge? that we will face in the coming years, crossing over the 20-year mark. You know what's very important for me is to somehow duplicate what got us started mm -hmm. and why we were that strong, we were very resolute during those, you know, the, the beginning we had because we were so clear and we had a mission. Yes. There were people, you know, hundreds of people, you know, thousands of people, depending on us. We had a mission, and it was not anymore about our checks, Donna, yes. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was just really, we wanted to be true to the, the promise that we made those people. And so for me right now, I want to trickle down that the people who's running QNET today, who's running the V, the new V partners, mm -hmm. that they somehow still have a clear picture because there are new people coming in, and right. the commitment they have to those people should be the same, at least gravity, to the kind of commitment we gave in the early days. Right. This has to continue. It doesn't have to stop. Because, of course, now it's different. You know, we're a bit, you know, wealthier as a company compared to 20 years ago, and somehow we could heavier. get comfortable, heavier, <laughs> and we could be more arrogant. You know, in our or, or less patient, I would say, but I believe that we have to maintain the same, you know, tolerance and patience that we had in the early days because we were still hungry. Yeah. Meaning we gotta remain hungry. Yeah. DG. Um, I think that uh, we've been through the most difficult phases already of this company, and uh, although this will be a little bit easier coming forward from here. As Japa had said, I do agree that the most important thing that I think we should be able to impart uh, to the new people or to the newer people who, are, who have joined us over the years is the reason why we are even here. Okay? 
I think that is the most important because I do not want QNet to simply be a business to the people running it. I would rather that they see this from the perspective that we have. And as you say, we need to keep that promise. We need to keep that fire uh, ablaze. And they should know why we are here. It's not about making the money. It's about keeping your integrity, which is really what differentiates us from the rest of the world. Which is really why we even found ourselves here in this very auditorium 20 years ago. We wanted to fulfill our word and keep our integrity. One thing I know, when I told VJ that I was going to get on board and he warned me that it was a one-way ticket, and that whoever was going to be on the train, I was going to have to learn how to, you know, uh, make the most of that. Yeah. I truly consider my biggest gain the past 20 years to be the fact that I am all the more richer because of the brothers, you know, our relationship and how that has really stood the test of time.